I don't know about you guys, but I am super excited because the Christmas season is almost upon us, and I absolutely love Christmas time. Uh, a little bit about me, I love Christmas, and I also love Easter, but the truth is uh, the other holidays just don't really do it for me. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, uh, when I was a kid slash teenager, I really loved the 4th of July. It may have even been at one point my favorite holiday. See, I grew up uh, middle-class America. I lived in this, uh, this cul-de-sac, and we lived in a nice house, and we're surrounded by nice houses with nice people, but we kind of lived the stereotypical individualistic lifestyle. You know, we were connected to our neighbors. We got along with them, and we had sometimes disagreements, but the real connections existed because of the friendships, really, of the kids. But the 4th of July was different. The 4th of July, our neighborhood got together to celebrate the being citizens of the greatest nation in the history of the world. And I can say that with absolute confidence because I've been to a couple other countries. I went to Canada for some hockey and some camps, and I've been to Honduras for like two weeks to go scuba diving. I know it's the greatest. And the 4th of July, every year, we would go around the neighborhood and we would collect money. In fact, we collected what would be several hundred dollars every year. And one year it would cut to $500. And we would gather this money to get food and really to get fireworks for the neighborhood party. And I had the hookup. There was a, a teacher that was at my school who worked at one of the fireworks stands who would set us up. He would have us come the day before 4th of July because he had to clear out all the stock. And so we would travel to the Native American reservations. I lived in the Puget Sound, and the reservations are scattered all over. And they could sell us whatever fireworks they wanted. Really, we wanted. And I'm talking about the best fireworks, not those little puny fireworks we get, not the poppets or the little sprinklers that shoot up like waist high. I'm talking the very best fireworks, the triple quadruple mortars that shoot some 200 feet in the air, the ones that explode with names like M1000, that if you held it in your hand, you probably lost your hand. And the fireworks that get, left the boom so big that it would like rattle your internal organs. We had a, we would get the best stuff. One year when my dad's, he had an extended bed on his truck. It, we filled the entire bed with fireworks and we would bring this back and we'd have a party. The kids would be celebrating all day. We would spend our day and if you're a parent or law enforcement, maybe you should plug your ears for a second, but we would take all those fireworks. We'd have Roman candle wars. We would take sparklers and we'd wrap them up in duct tape and make sparkler bombs because we thought it was hilarious to go around the neighborhood and set off explosions that would set off people's car alarms. And at night, we would put on a show that rivaled the professionals in the area. We would have at the bottom of our cul-de-sac like five, six, seven mortar pits. We'd reinforce them with sand so there was no, no danger of them tipping over. We would actually lay out all the fireworks, the big fireworks, to put that in like in order of what we do. And sometimes it felt like we would go for an hour lighting off round after round to light up the night sky. It was this, America, this amazing time that we would gather together as community to celebrate the fact that we were citizens of America. And we could think of no greater way to celebrate that, to celebrate our country, than to blow up a tiny little chunk of it. But over the years, my love of the 4th of July has kind of waned. And really for two reasons. The first one is just the reality is that I've gotten older and safety and responsibility uh, are more real to me. But the other reason is I've struggled. I've struggled because I'm now, I'm a citizen of two different things. I'm a citizen, yes, of the United States, but I'm also a citizen of the gospel, a citizen of heaven. And I've wrestled with how do those two things work together? By that I mean, how does being a citizen of the gospel interact with and shape how I live as a citizen of the United States of America. And today we're going to be looking at what it means to be a citizen of the gospel. We're going to be wrapping up the first chapter of Philippians, looking at the last four verses, in which Paul is writing to the church in Philippi about what it means to be citizens of the gospel and what it actually looks like to live that out. So let's read through it. 
He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer his, for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul starts off this part of this passage of scripture with this statement, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in some translations and what some scholars would be a more direct translation, it would say, behave as citizens of the gospel. That we find Paul, a Roman citizen, writing to the church of Philippi, a member of the Roman Empire. And we got to, to understand the significance of this, we need some context, right? Philippi was a, was a city that was conquered by the Roman Empire. But when it was conquered, it became a Roman city-state. It was a major part of the expanding Roman Empire. It was economically prosperous and well-defended. It had a gold mine. It was on a river that allowed it to have a major trade route. And it was a central hub and the Roman Empire expanding to the east. And what it meant for the Romans, or excuse me, the, the citizens of Philippi was that they became full citizens of Rome. And because of that, they had special privileges. They could buy and own land, or buy and sell land, excuse me. They didn't have to pay poll or land tax. They were fully protected by Roman law, and they had special local uh, government elect elected officials. They were proud to be Roman citizens. It was a source of pride for them. And here is Paul, also a Roman citizen, writing to them and reminding them that yes, you are Roman citizens, but you are to behave as citizens of the gospel. And Paul goes on and he lays out what that looks like. And so we see several different things. And one of those things we see is that gospel citizens are united. Paul was, this was a letter Paul wrote that it was encouraging. It was, a, it was to encourage them to continue in their ways. He saw the church in Philippi was united and he wanted to encourage them to continue to be united. Paul understood that unity doesn't just happen by accident. You're not united simply because you're together. In fact, the opposite is often true. That you may start out united, but the vision will inevitably come. And he was saying, and unity takes intentionality. And he gives two examples of how this works, how unity needs to exist both internally and externally. The internal part, he goes on to say, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Paul's saying, you have to remain united unified together, that you are together right now. You have to stay together. The church is supposed to be one. It's power. It's most powerful when it remains as one, not fighting amongst itself, but as one people. And Paul had seen in his history of starting up churches, he had seen how churches had constantly fallen apart because they ate themselves from the inside that they became fractured because they started adding and subtracting things from the gospel that he had given them. That they had started, uh, they, had, they, they had turned against one another. That they had accepted teaching of, of people like the Judaizers who said, you're supposed to put the law, the Old Testament law, on top of the gospel. And Paul had seen the destruction it had caused and was confirmed, concerned for the church in Philippi that they would do the same. He wanted them to remain as one, to not let the secondary issues divide them, to allow the secondary issues to exist, the beliefs that aren't central to the gospel, and allow them to be there and to work through it. Several weeks ago, our teaching team, we went away on a day retreat in which we uh, talked about some topics about the church, and we, we worked through the teaching schedule coming up to 2023. But during that time, 
we were able to have some just impromptu discussions about our positions on theology. And during that, what came up is, yes, we are united under the central parts of the gospel of who Jesus and God is and that he died for us about grace and faith. But about these secondary issues, we have differences of opinions that we approach the gospel through the same interpretive lens, but can still arrive at some differences. And what was encouraging was that we didn't leave opposed that these differences of opinions strengthened our bond with one another, that we were able to hear one another's opinions and beliefs and be reinforced by that, that I could hear somebody say, yeah, here's what I believe, and I could walk away with a better understanding of people uh, that I work with, with other people in the church. That disagreements do not have to mean disunity. And unfortunately, disagreements over secondary issues have divided the church. That there's research that says in not just America, but over the entire world, that there are some 40,000 different Christian denominations, which blows my mind. I don't understand how that number can even exist. But 40,000 denominations. And denominations in and of themselves aren't bad. It's great that people are able to gather and worship in ways that are a little bit different or be under even teaching that, they, that lines up with some of their secondary beliefs. The problem is that too often denominations, which exist under the one church of Christ, have been fighting amongst each other. That they don't celebrate their differences, that they too often come in conflict, they oppose one another. And divisions sometimes, denominations sometimes, have been caused because a community tore itself apart over secondary issues. That things like uh, election, predestination, the cessation or continuing of the gifts of the Spirit, things such as that haven't allowed us to work together, but they've tore communities and churches apart. We're supposed to be united. Several years ago, there was a a news article online about this Landover Baptist Church. And this church had existed for apparently 100 years. But there was always this underlying tension within it. And then recently, it came to a head. They actually had to bring in an outside pastor to mediate. And this is what they decided after all this disagreement, that they would create four different services with four different teaching pastors with four different messages every weekend. And the disagreement was a piano bench. Not No, the location on the stage of a piano bench. And this caught the attention of the world and people were like, wow, that's terrible. And the news article was actually written as satire. But what was so disappointing was that people looked at it and said, yeah, that probably could happen. That the church is known so much for being fractured that it's believable that the location of a piano bench could fracture a church. We cannot be, we have to, excuse me, we have to remain united as one. And Paul wanted the church in Philippi. He wants us to stay as one. And as I read this, I love the the picture that Paul often draws. And I don't know that this was intended. And maybe it's just me looking back to this historical lens. This idea of standing firm. And all I can picture, being that he's writing to a church in Rome, or the Roman Empire, is this picture of a Roman soldier standing proud, firm, resolute, never wavering, never retreating. But the strength of the Roman army wasn't in the individual soldier. It was the power of its amassed might. The power of the church, or excuse me, the church is most powerful when it is united as one. And Paul goes on to address how unity looks externally. He goes on and says, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel that we are supposed to be a church moving forward for advancing the gospel as one, side by side, together, working together. And he uses this word striving. And in the Greek, the root word is athleo. It's where we get the word athletics from. And again, I can just picture it through this historical lens. Paul brings up this image of the Olympic athlete 
beating himself into submission, training no matter the circumstance and overcoming the rain, sleet, snow, whatever it was, all in an effort to bring glory to his home city. And we're supposed to look more like that. We're supposed to be striving forward, bringing glory, not for ourselves or for our city, but for our heavenly father. That the life of Christian isn't about comfort It's about striving forward for advancing the gospel. That the church is unified, not just for itself, but for mission. That we are to move forward as one. There's this idea called an arrow of alignment. And it it applies to the church. How are we moving forward on mission together? And too often, the church looks like this. Here's the, the big white arrow. Here's the mission of God moving forward. He's very clear. He has a mission. He laid it out in the Great Commission. And we're supposed to be following along with God. And too often, we look like this. We're all over the place. We got a couple people kind of following God. We got people battling each other. We got people wanting to jump ship and create their own mission. We got people who think that mission is the worst mission in the world. And so they're going the opposite way. The church isn't supposed to be divided like this. The church is supposed to look like this. That we are together, side by side, striving forward under one power who is the Holy Spirit working within us on mission, the mission that Christ laid out for us. And I want to be clear that these arrows, they all look the same, they're the same color. It doesn't mean everything's the same. We're not all supposed to be the same people. God created us different for a reason. We have different experiences. We have different backgrounds. Sometimes minor different beliefs. But that's supposed to strengthen us as we move forward together in unity. Paul wasn't talking about uniformity. He wanted us united. The second thing we see is gospel citizens are unafraid. Gospel citizens are to be unafraid by anything that comes at us. Paul goes on and he says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Here's Paul writing to the church in Philippi. And he has lived at least the second half of his life. He has lived this out. He is being persecuted everywhere he's gone. In fact, as he's writing this, he is imprisoned. And there's, there's debate about where exactly he is in prison and what that looks like. There's actually three uh, widely accepted beliefs, but the most commonly accepted one is that he is imprisoned, that he is under house arrest. And when I say house arrest, I think we need to have a different picture because when I picture house arrest, and I think we often picture house arrest, is like this comfy house or maybe even your own house that is reserved for millionaires who commit white-collar crimes and they can come and go as they please. They have an ankle tracker and like they can be gone as long as they show up every 72 hours. But Paul was clear that whatever that actually looked like, he was both imprisoned And his life was being threatened. This was a big deal. And he's writing this with a history of persecution. Everywhere he has gone to spread the gospel, he has been chased out of cities. He has multiple times been beaten to where he has almost died. He has been imprisoned. In fact, when he establishes the church in Philippi, he does it after he has been tortured, imprisoned. But what he does is he remains unafraid. That through the persecution, he never deviates from the gospel. And he's writing to this church in Philippi, a church he's proud of, encouraging them to continue doing the same. They are not frightened in anything by their opponents. He wants to remind them to continue not being frightened by anything by their opponents. And they were passing the test. And my concern is, as we read this, that the American church, we are failing. We are failing this because we don't look like this. We are frightened in everything by our opponents. This, this word frightened that Paul uses in the Greek, it would mean, it would, it would draw forth an image of a stampeding herd of horses. And I, I used to love 
westerns, they were a big part of my uh, growing up. And there would often be in the movie the stampeding horses, right? There would be like a herd of horses and there would be some danger, real or perceived, that would rile them up and cause them to panic. And they would bolt off in whatever direction seemed appropriate, regardless of the consequences. They would run over people. They'd run over themselves if they tripped and they would trample themselves. And ultimately what they would often do, and I have no idea if this is realistic or not, but it made a good picture, is they would run to the cliff and then run themselves over the side to their death. They would panic and lash out in any way possible. And I'm scared that the church often looks like that. We panic and we lash out in any way to defend ourselves or to escape danger. We have adopted too often this idea that we are being persecuted by a culture. And sometimes it's real. Sometimes it's not. But how we often react does not match up the way the church in Philippi does. They were experiencing real persecution and they remain steadfast. They were experiencing some kinds of persecution from the culture and they remain steadfast. The American church, the culture it's dealing with today did not look that different from the ch- culture the church in Philippi was dealing with. Rome often looked exactly like America. Let's look at a couple of ways. The first one, the hot topic of the day that's been going on my entire life, the issue of abortion, that in America it is becoming more widely accepted that it is okay to terminate a pregnancy to end life because it would be inconvenient for a parent. That it, that it looks at life created in the image of God, valuable, but when it comes up in conflict with bodily autonomy and convenience, it's not worth anything. And this was true for the church in Philippi. Under Roman rule, it was common that if a child was unwanted, they would get rid of it. And they didn't have the technology that we have today where we can end the the life in utero. They would take the child after it was born. They would take it to a, a field. They would put it in a jar or just set it down in the open and leave the child there to die. And the church in Philippi opposed that. And what they did was they would go out into the field, find the child, gather it up, take it home, nurse it back to health, and raise it as their own. Let's look at uh, sexual identity. That in America is becoming more widely accepted that, that, that sex is okay with anybody regardless of marriage, that marriage can exist between anybody, that the will of God, that sex and marriage is for one man and for one woman, that that's history, that, that it can be whatever you want. They were dealing with that in Philippi too. In Rome, homosexuality was rampant. In fact, historians look back and I've heard this statement that, that, that women were for creating children and men were for pleasure. And the church's response to that at the time, remain rooted in the truth. Don't give in to the culture. Teach our children what God calls us to. All right, let's look at one more. One more, the hot, the hot one of the, of the last couple of years, cancel culture. That, uh, that somebody can lose their platform, their social media, because they share a difference of opinions or beliefs. And I just want to say, as kind of an aside, I think that sometimes we view it as persecution, but what we know about social media, that I, I actually might be a blessing. But cancel culture exists today. It existed back then. Except cancel culture back then didn't mean you would de- lose your Facebook or your Twitter or Instagram. It meant that you would lose your livelihood or your life. That they would chase you out of the town. That they would imprison you. That they would even put you to death. And here's here's the deal that I see with the American church is that we're not responding the same way that the church in Philippi did, the same way that, that Paul did. That in response to perceived or real persecution, We're not remaining firmly rooted in the gospel. What we're too often doing is adopting the tactics of a culture that we're so quick to condemn. That we're putting our faith not in Jesus Christ, but in a government or a political party or a country. 
And in the end, what we do is we look like the people who are being attacked by, that we are lashing out, that we've accepted that it's okay to shame people, to belittle people, to mock people, that for some reason it's okay to, to, to be against somebody suffering a mental disease of gender dysphoria. They need love, not, not derision, not, not pushing them away. We've accepted now that we're so afraid of homosexuality that the churches that I've been reading about are pushing to close down libraries because there's a couple books there about homosexuality. We are responding exactly the way they're responding to us. We're not supposed to look like them. We're supposed to live amongst them. We're supposed to love them. We're supposed to sacrifice for them. We're supposed to bring them into our community, but we're not supposed to respond like they respond. We're supposed to respond like the church in Philippi. We're supposed to respond like Paul. We're supposed to respond like Jesus. They didn't fight back. They laid their lives down. They said, yeah, we're not going to participate that. We're going to do what's right, but we're not going to fight you. We're going to love people with the truth of the gospel. And to be clear, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be voting. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the influence of popular culture on particularly our children. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be worried about bad actors uh, influencing important social movements. But the gospel should always shape how we react to these things, never the culture. And this being frightened, I've seen it also push the church into this, this thing that has been growing for years, but is becoming more prevalent, this Christian nationalism. That because we're so scared, we're now changing the mission of the church. That the mission of the church was originally to save lost souls, to, to join Jesus in saving lost souls. And it's somehow becoming uh, more accepted that we're now to save America. That's never what the church was about. And the truth is, we can't save America. America is destined to fail. And I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that. It hurts to say, so I'm going to say it again. America is destined to fail. We can't save it because of two realities. The first one is that the, the truth of history is that no nation has ever withstood the test of time. I find it interesting that Paul's writing to the church to remain unified so they don't destroy themselves while Rome is destroyed mostly because of internal disunity. That the greed and corruption and disagreement and, and the, the uprising church can't withhold together while external forces destroy it as well. And the second reason is in the end times, at some point, the United States doesn't exist. The United States cannot be saved. Souls are to be saved. That is our mission. We can't change our mission because we're afraid of our opponents. We have to remain fully focused on the gospel. The last thing we see in here is that gospel citizens suffer for the gospel. That out of being unified both internally and on mission and remaining unafraid that we can do this. We can suffer for the gospel. And it seems so contrary to what we desire. But Paul says that's what we're supposed to do. Suffer for the gospel. He says, going on, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. That part of being Christian, part of being a follower of Christ, being a citizen of the gospel, is accepting that suffering is actually a gracious gift from God. And when I'm talking about suffering, I'm talking about persecution for your beliefs. 
that Paul says in the, in, in the original language Greek, that's the word he uses, is that we are to, that suffering, excuse me, is a gracious gift of God. That in our suffering, we are united with Christ, that we join him in his mission, that in his suffering, by our suffering, we are joining him in advancing his mission, the gospel. That part of Christian life is to accept that suffering, persecution is inevitable and not to fight from it or run from it, to embrace it. Because it is one of our greatest witnesses to the outside world. He said that, excuse me, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. That when we remain unafraid, unwavering in the face of persecution, in the face of suffering, it says something to the outside world. It leaves them dumbstruck. They don't know what to do. When we are attacked, when we are threatened, and we don't respond the same way, they see something. They expect, they expect to be attacked back. And when we don't do that, all they have left is to sit in their own wrath and in their own destruction. We're not supposed to wage war against them. We're supposed to share the gospel with them. It is how we witness to the world. It is why uh, I often hear, why are we not growing like the early church? Why are we in decline? It's because we don't look like the early church. We panic in the face of any amount of persecution. We infight of any internal persecution. The early church never fought back. They just said, okay, if we're being persecuted, that's fine because I'm being persecuted for Christ. Paul said to himself, I will not be ashamed of the gospel to live as Christ, to die as gain. It doesn't matter what you do to me. My life is temporary, but the gospel is eternal. I will never be ashamed. That it doesn't matter what you do to me. It doesn't matter what you do to the church. Jesus wins. What are we afraid of? Jesus can't lose because he's already had his victory. We're just joining him in sharing it. I want to end with this idea that the most celebrated and successful advancers of the gospel weren't warriors. They were martyrs. I'm going to release the campus pastors. I love you guys. See ya. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, we had just take a moment to look at our missional moment today. Out of uh, the passage that we covered, the question that we have is, who are you striving side by side with? Who are you united with? What members of the church, and by that I mean the body of Christ, who are you moving for? Not looking for comfort, but looking to advance the gospel with. Who do you have with you? That the Christian life isn't supposed to be by itself. We are supposed to be a community on purpose, with purpose. And the second question I have is looking at who you're going, striving with, where are they going? Are they serving to advance the gospel? And if they're not, you may need to evaluate who you're striving side by side with. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Have a good day.